Hello, Rotarians. Welcome, friends, to the July 1st meeting of the Rotary Club of Louisville. I'm Jean West, owner and producer of Faces West Productions, president of the club, and the Paul Harris Fellow. To provide our invitation is Walt Kuno, chair of the Promise Scholars Committee, past club director, president elect of our club, Rotarian of the Year recipient, and Paul Harris Fellow. Thank you, Gene. Hello, Rotarians. Life is good. You're going to hear that a lot. I told Gene how pleased I was to give the invitation today because you're going to hear about my friend and Rotary's friend, Christopher Tuex, who I'm privileged to call my personal friend in Chris. I'm challenging, I'm channeling Paul Harvey here and giving you some of the rest of the story early. Chris is one of our Rotary Honor Scholars mentors in Iroquois and Western high schools. Craig Rooney invited his brother Rob to join us. Rob invited Chris. Chris, Chris comes often and the room lights up when he walks in. He embodies service above self in all that he does. Thank you, Craig. Thank you, Rob. And especially thank you, Chris. Can't wait to hear more. Let us pray. Oh God, bless us in our service. Help us to be your arms and legs and hands and feet. Thank you for the folks who work to bring joy and light and hope and faith and pardon and justice and service and love into this world. Help us to be some of those folks. I pray this in all the holy names of God. Amen. Right. Now for a real quick entertainment. So our Rotary Promise Scholars, our Rotary Honor Scholars at Western Iroquois, we have, we have partnered with the Ball 502. Ball 502's colors are orange, ours are blue. Our scholars, when they graduate, get this grant around their now. So I'm gonna drink tea right now. I think one of our greatest scholars. Thank you. Thank you all for all you do. And now to lead us in the pledge and the four-way test is Ken Grossman, owner, executive, image, custom clothier, vice president of our club, past chair of the Seekers Committee, and Paul Harris Fellow. Thank you, Gene. Um, I, I too, uh, my, my relationship with Christopher Tuex isn't quite as deep as Walt's, but uh, many of you may recall Chris spoke to our club about five or six years ago. And uh, I told him today he did such a good job when he got back. So we're, we're, we're glad you're here. Chris. Thanks for coming. Uh, of all days to give the Pledge of Allegiance, it's the weekend of the 4th of July. And a uh, good time to reflect and think about what America means to us and our history, our independence, our freedoms. So please join me as we give the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> And please join me in the four way test of what Rotarians think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it be a better friendship? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? You may be seated. It is always our pleasure to uh, welcome guests to our meetings, both virtual and uh, in person. So I would like to personally welcome my guest, sorry, with Senator Rand Paul, Senator Paul, and the Blue White Selzy Cooper, Communications Director for Fred Hall, Whitney Mendez, Rob Gidden, State Director, Fred Hall, Fred Hall, Christopher Tuex, of course, of the speaker, David Nickley, Board Chair, Kay Stewart, in David Stem, and Chris Welch, Deputy Director. Also, David Smith. WLOU radio owner, where are you, David? Over there. Archie Dale, WLOU radio general manager. President Tori Murden McClure, President Tori 
Attorney, partner, chief diversity and inclusion officer for Dwayne Morris, Washington, D.C., Mark Lasalio, media outreach coordinator, NOAA's Monitor Marine Sanctuary, Chesapeake, Virginia, Joseph Lasalio, strategic consultant, MasterCard Corporation, New York, New York, Mark West, investigator, New Orleans Police Department, Ingrid Johnson, philanthropist, farmer, speed museum, and all these center board member, all these Florida, and John Archer. Owner of Pierce Archer Galleries, Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you for joining us virtually. Thank you for being here as guests. All guests who are here in person, please stand so that we can recognize you. Thank 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 Please stay after the meeting for a brief what is rotary session. And uh, we can have who's doing the what is rotary session this week. So we're in the back. So we're in the back. So just, just like, oh, back here for Melissa's reading. Okay. What all Paul Harris fellows, please stand. All of that is recognition of giving an appreciation to any Rotarian who contributes a thousand dollars or more to the Rotary Foundation. And uh, there are a lot of Rotarians in here who are close, and we will be telling you how we can help you push that level to be a Paul Harris Fellow. We salute you, we thank you for your service, and we will salute you every meeting. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome. Past President Luke Schmidt to the podium. Luke is President L.B. Schmidt and Associate, past President of the club, Chair of the Community Impact Committee, and a Paul Harris Fellow. Thanks, President Gene. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, since last year, the Community Impact Committee, or the CIC for short, has been working extensively on issues related to racism, justice, and equity in our city. This effort started shortly after the tragic Breonna Taylor shootings and the civil unrest which followed. We started with two full day virtual forums <clears throat> back in August, during which we received outstanding presentations from 16 leaders in this arena. One of the things that we heard from was several of our presenters. That while it's great that the Rotary Club of Lowell is engaging in some important issues, it's also important that your club, our club, needs to make sure that it has its own house in order. This was great advice. We created six subcommittees to work on this overall effort, one of which, the Internal Issues Subcommittee, which is chaired by past President Ray Braun. This subcommittee was charged with making sure that our house is in order. And through Greg's leadership, three things happened. First, the establishment of the club's first ever diversity, equity, and inclusion guy statement. Second, the establishment of the club's first ever vendor commitment to the guy statement. And then third, the establishment of the club's first ever DEI committee. Each of these items was approved by the Rotary Club of Board back in February of this year. And I'm here today to speak briefly about the DEI committee. When the committee was approved by the board in February, our board took this a step further and made the DEI committee a board level committee. What this means is that this committee work is elevated to work closely with the board in achieving its goals. It also means that the DEI committee's chairperson automatically becomes a member of this club's board of directors. The DEI committee is charged with periodically reviewing our club's initiatives related to diversity with membership development, intention, and more importantly, lead on these issues. I'm fortunate to have Rotarian Kevin Fields in position to serve as the DEI committee's first chairperson. And Kevin is joining us virtually today. Kevin brings a stellar bio to the committee. He's the president and CEO of the Global Central Community Centers. He's a civil engineer in the early 2000s, but also 
specialist and he has some great working knowledge of the inner city issues here at Walton. Kevin received his Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Western Kentucky University, Master's degree in Public Administration, and Urban Planning is pretty well. Our new DEI committee, with Kevin's leadership, is primed to do great things. And I want to encourage any Rotarian who's interested in making a difference to consider joining the committee. Because last week, Karen Morrison told me that she'd like to so that's a great start. So please contact Kevin directly or listen in the office if you're interested to get started. But now, I'm pleased to introduce Denise Sears, chairperson of our CIC Policies and Justice Subcommittee, and also Tony Newberry, who is a member of that subcommittee, who will share with you some exciting news about one of the subcommittee's initiatives. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So very quickly, um, many of you know, I am president and CEO of SOS International, and I have to give a call out to one of my amazing board members, uh, Dr. O.J. Oleka. And to my surprise, where I worked before, one of my favorite board members is here, General Rob Gibbons. And they're sitting very close to each other, and you need to watch should they start comparing notes. <laughs> One of the many things I love about Hillary is how much I learn every time I come to a meeting, whether it be a weekly meeting or a committee meeting, I leave smarter than when I came. And that knowledge often leads me to become a more engaged community member. Perhaps it was an issue that I really cared deeply about. And therefore, I, with my knowledge, I could actually take action. The Community Impact Policies and Justice Committee learned about the very, very low felony threshold in Kentucky um, uh, during the speakers forum that you referenced. That was an issue I really cared deeply about. And I was able to join a movement that helped pass new legislation that raised that felony threshold in the state of Kentucky. We also uncovered facts about a practice happening locally that we didn't know anything about, nor did many people. And we started educating ourselves. We became knowledgeable and as concerned citizens. Some of us chose to take action. And I want to introduce one of my amazing committee members. I'm using the word amazing a lot, aren't I? Well, it is an amazing day. So, Tony Newberry. Thank you, Denise. Uh, it's a, a privilege to be here to uh, report to the club and to everybody assembled about uh, one focused piece of work that the Policy and Justice Subcommittee and members of the subcommittee undertook this uh, past few months. Uh, through the research and education process that we referenced, we discovered an issue at uh, the Louisville Metro Department of Corrections, which seemed to cry out for attention. But that was the long-standing practice of charging very high fees for phone calls from inmates to their families. And then building part of that revenue, a major piece of that revenue, into the corrections budget on an annual basis. Now, during the pandemic, family visitations were shut down in the Jefferson County Jail, which is actually facilities all over the nation. So phone calls became the primary way the families had to stay in contact with loved ones waiting for trial. The call fees ranged as high as almost $10 for a 15-minute call to a cell phone. And in our research, we found out that uh, for many families, that cost could easily exceed $100 a month, in some cases more than $300 a month. Now, the phone calls were managed by a national prison telecom company. Which had explained in exchange for exclusive arrangements with the uh, Metro Jail system, provided uh, last year $633,000 per year in revenue back to Metro uh, Corrections. And that was a key part of the budget. 
So in our research, we, we reviewed uh, information that had been um, developed by the non local nonprofit called the Normal Family Justice Advocates that shows that, among other things, the incarceration of parents is a serious adverse childhood experience, one that is even more traumatic for families and children than for those who are awaiting trial. On the other hand, frequent contacts, research has shown, between families and their incarcerated loved ones can lessen the negative effects and reduce recidivism. But when phone calls are expensive, that becomes very, very difficult. Now, when our, one of our subcommittee members, Kevin Lynch, looked into the contract between the system and the telecom company, he discovered that the contract had been in place, renewed automatically for the last 10 years, but the contract did permit renegotiation at any time. Our research also showed that in many states and cities around the country, these fees, phone calls, are, are being eliminated. Um, this is a recognition of the disproportionate impact on Black and poor families. So as the Metro Council budget hearings got underway in May, our group uh, pursued two approaches. Luke Schmidt wrote a letter to the mayor asking information about the correction phone fees. And we also had as individuals multiple contacts with key Metro Council members, including the President, uh, Council President David James and Budget Committee Chair Bill Holland. Now, the, the results of these efforts um, have been encouraging. Mayor Fisher responded to this letter. We have a senior member of his cabinet address each of the issues that Luke raised. Then, three weeks ago, when the mayor adjusted his budget revenue forecast by 11.5 million, he proposed one of the expenditures out of that revenue to eliminate the corrections fund. Uh, about a week ago, Monday, June the 21st, when the Metro Council Budget Committee unanimously approved a budget amendment and included replacement funds in the corrections budget to allow for the elimination of those in fees. And more than that, it put a deadline, a uh, drop dead date of December 31st of this year, this calendar year, to make that happen. <laughs> Training and all the Metro Council members are doing that. Uh, all the language was included in the final budget passed by the by Thursday. On, on, on. So that's the short version of the story. It's been pretty long already. But I, I do close by stressing that while our efforts were informed by the work of the Community Impact Committee, each of the actions that we were involved with. Citizen action, nonpartisan, not representative of the work of the but informed by and inspired by the work of the CIC committee. As Denise Sears has phrased it, this is a great example of how Rotary was able to serve as a source of information that empowered us as citizens to advocate for social justice issues. <laughs> That's powerful. And that's the path we are. Now, again, we're not activists as we're curious. We are business and civic leaders who are responsive and inclusive. Thank you, team, for that. That's awesome. Okay, here we go. You know, this program, uh, we have been planning for months. We had no idea this was going to be such a huge day. All right. The headline of the December 23rd, 2020 Courier Journal read, President Trump grants federal pardon for global activist Christopher Chuet. The news release The news release from the White House said, Chuet is widely credited as a trusted voice of reason and peace in global that both sides turn to if tensions arise between the police and local community. He was also pardoned by Governor Matt Levin in 2019 for his state crimes. He now leads Game Changers, a nonprofit organization which leads a movement for social justice through education and nonviolence. He's now heading up a program called Future Healers, which you he will hear about. He'll tell me about it in a moment. Now, that article that I mentioned 
also talked about the fact that Republican Senator Rand Paul was a driving force behind the party. Senator Randall Howard Paul is an ophthalmologist and has been serving as the junior senator of Kentucky since 2011. Born in Pittsburgh, he is married to his lovely wife, Kelly. They have three sons. They live in Bowling Green. Yeah. She and I are commiserating about the three sons who will never get married and never have grandchildren and never have girls. So, uh, you know that story. Senator Paul is up for re election in 2022. And yet, it's going to get interesting. Please welcome them both. Senator Paul. Okay, we can get it complicated if we got one line. I'm going to try to. You got another one? I'm going to try to. Yes. They've got all these wires in mind. So that's going to really screw you guys up. Well, they're going to be. Can you. Yeah. Do you need me to take all the mics with me? Yeah. Are you good? Okay, fine. All right. Well, this is quite the thing to have a chat, isn't it? <laughs> you have to tell me how did this come about? Because you, Christopher, are telling me that you didn't know anything about this, correct? Yeah, and it, yeah, and let me give clarity to everything. And I'll just put it this way. So, um, the first um, request for me to um, think about seeking a pardon almost happened about that. And my family and I were very reluctant because the federal charge was 35 years ago. 35 years ago. So we had moved past it. Our mindset was why go through the process of pardons? My understanding of pardons was that usually those situations happen as far as a state pardon or even a federal pardon. They happen kind of in a you know, short time frame of, of, of the crime or the charges. You know, where you know it becomes you know a felony. So we told the individuals who approached us, uh, Gina and everybody in the room, um, that we bypassed any uh, idea of seeking a pardon and putting an application. That's where my family and uh, we were at with them. And then lo and behold, in 2019, uh, Due to a very wonderful, aggressive, and strong wheel retired Air Force Brigadier General by the name of Rod Gibbons, the pardon conversation resurfaced again. And so Rob called me and uh, I talked to my family again. And we turned Rob down, I know, at least three times and told him we were going to bypass it again. Then my daughter's family said, let him try, but tell him to be quiet about it. Don't be this. Not a, not a lot of fanfare about this. We in our mindset had one wrong. So we went through the process. Rob helped us go through the process. Senator Paul was instrumental in that. But equally, what everybody needs to know is wrong. That the White House also mentioned that one passionate and very strong willed female in this division that leaves a powerful university, which is the fault of the university, was instrumental. Her and the chief of surgery of the University of Louisville Hospital, Dr. J. David Richardson, I'm talking about Toy Murder before, who's over here. And I want to give her a hand. And what she was <laughs> Their letters were attached to Dr. Paul's efforts and Rob's efforts and his team's efforts. And the White House pointed that out when they announced that release. And so at the end of the day, we were reluctant. We are in much gratitude and thanks, ma'am. But equally at the same time, what was the, the bottom line of this part? Presidential parties are as rare as they get. We didn't give it a, a a hope whatsoever, to be quite frank with you all. 
we knew uh, Dr. Paul was a strong advocate for uh, criminal justice reform. And at the end of the day, uh, how many party applications come to the president of the United States, regardless of what party you're not? I mean, it's really tough. We didn't give it a chance. However, uh, when it happened, my family and I decided only one thing was going to uh, evolve out of this. One, we were going to keep talking to young people about second chances and redemption. We were going to stay grounded and we understand the significance of a presidential party. But at the end of the day, nothing's changed with me. And Gene, quite frankly, and everybody in the room, uh, what we tell kids is don't wait on a pardon. Keep redemption and second chances. Feel it from within. Do the right thing and work hard at it. And watch the results come in uh, so many beautiful ways. What we all know is the two of you have been friends for years. You've been working together for a while. Okay. We met uh, quite nine years ago. And the interesting thing about it is before we got involved with specifically looking at the pardon case, we've done lots of things together. But more generally, I've been in favor of second chances and restoration of rights. So I think in maybe 2016 or 17, I went to the state legislature and testified in favor of the bill to restore rights to people. Sometimes it's after service in a debate over how long it should be, what has to happen. But I think the thing is, is, you know, committing a mistake or whatever is should not be a, it's not like a brand new or permanent age. Shouldn't, shouldn't be something permanent. It should be a way to overcome that. And there's probably nobody I know more deserving to try harder, you know, to have better relations in rural and less violence than Christopher. So I don't can think of nobody uh, more deserving for this. But more generally, there's something that we all have to talk about. You know, my party says, we're a party of family values. Well, no, you're not, unless you want me to get back to work and make mistakes. And so we actually did that. And, and both parties came together in the state legislature. We had an explanation for them. I was at the Urban League when uh, I think it was uh, an attorney in Tennessee, Riley, gave a large donation to the Urban League, several hundred thousand dollars. And the first day, they had attorneys down there, a thousand people lined up. And it's like, what could be better than that? And not only you're, you're selecting for people who made mistakes, if you're coming to an expense direction, you're not there because you're still making mistakes, you're there because you actually have chosen to go the right way. And what, what better way of doing this? And I think more people have become aware of this. Um, we had uh, Mr. Caudill, like Caudill C, who has people, not only had criminal records, but people have been addicted to alcohol or addicted to drugs. And it's like, there's so many good stories and good news things. I know sometimes we, we have a lot of bad news when we turn on the television set or a lot of bad things we think are happening. There are some bad things happening. And yet, there are some good things happening too. And I was happy to be a part of this. I talked to President Trump about it. And I remember, was it right before Christmas when we found out about this? It's about day before. Yeah, I think I was yeah, you. Yeah, you, you called me around seven that night, just before you called the communications uh, point person, Kelsey Cooper, had called and said, Did uh, you see any uh, news reports? I said, No. And she said, You better look. And about that time, the phone would ring a lot yeah. out of town, in town, all that. And she says, the White House now released that they granted you a full and unconditional presidential party, which means everything is just wiped away um, on the federal level um, with no strings attached. And by the way, if anybody wondered in here, nine years of a relationship with Dr. Paul, not one time has he ever asked me to be about any uh, connection to any political issues, events, or anything. Now, I want to make sure that. Everybody understands, and just to you know, rewind this a little bit real quick, Gene, we met because his former state director and my good friend who passed away earlier this year, Jim Melvin, Attorney Jim Melvin, uh, came to me, and Don Dish was our connection. Uh, I can call him a great friend and a mentor also. Uh, Jim's law partner said, Jim wants you to you know, consider meeting somebody. And I said, who is it? He said, U.S. Senator Rand Paul. And I said, well, what's the kind of rollout for that? 
So well, we want to get you down to West Louisville and talk about, you know, Rand's role in Washington and all that. I said, well, let me do a little research. So then I found out he was an eye surgeon. I said, aha. I said, that fuels my passion because individuals in the judicial arena and especially the medical arena really fuel my passion besides those in the station. <laughs> all right. But with that said, though, uh, Jim said, uh, would you be willing to set up a meeting? I said, under one condition. I need to bring some young individuals that I have relationships with in different neighborhoods in West Louisville. And they got to sit down, Dr. Paul also. And what we want to talk about is this medical matter. I'm not really interested in, in the politics. And that's really how this evolved. They wanted all the rest of them. And we sat and we talked to the community center. And it was about the medical career that really uh, intrigued the young ones in my show. Okay, so let's go. <laughs> you knew <laughs> this was coming. Um, we, we talk about, we're talking about violence. Okay, it, it is plaguing our community. And you both have been victims of violence, okay, in completely different ways. What is happening? What is going on? What is what's the fix? <laughs> so now Jean asked an uh, excellent question, very complicated. Uh, I would like to point out my brother Ed White uh, in this room. We lost a dear uh, loved one to violence, and what he does with River City Drum for is unspeakable. And Eddie just want to give you. Okay. But violence is complicated, it's nasty, and it's not easy, easy subject matter. But what kind of also uh, makes me scratch my head sometimes, Jamie and everybody, as related to the 2020 Dodge Coin, the summer of arrest. At the same time, we ended up with 173 fatal homicides. And 587 non fatal shootings where people were wounded and sent to U of L Hospital and on rare occasions, the Northern Children's Hospital, with kids that got hit by stray bullets. Gene's question is what's going on and why? Where's the fix at? There is no easy fix. There is no stop the bleed deal that's just where you can just grab it, wave the magic wand, and hopefully the numbers will kick down quickly. It's complicated. It's caught up in a lot of root causes, but equally at the same time, I truly believe, Gene and everybody, that these processes of a young person wanting to pick up a gun and lash out in the most vicious way starts at an early evolution process. I believe that we, not you and white, but we've been behind the eight ball for years with young people. Give me that. That at the end of the day, the symptoms are there as early as early childhood education ages, and especially through K through eight. But we always wanted to use now, which I, I describe as the old dinosaur model. Intervene in high school and you'll solve the problem. No, that's over. It's a public health crisis. I'm pointing at that. The surgeons I collaborate with believe us that. So, as it relates to Christopher QX game changers, we're starting to intervene at the Early education ages, especially four into 13 years old, because we're probably 15 or 20 years behind the eight ball on this problem. Where if we would have took it serious, whether it's JCPS and others, not no knock on anybody. Anybody knows me, I'm not about sour grapes and, and complaining about a bunch of stuff. But at the end of the day, Gene, to be quite frank with you and the crowd. This problem starts for me at the earliest ages, and there's many ways to try to at least deal with the issue, but it's complex, and parents have to be a part of the collaboration to say this is detrimental to your health, and we need to look at violence as a poisonous issue, and all the things that are attached to these temperaments that lead to violent outlash. No easy solution, but 
I believe what Senator Paul, and I quickly want to say this, as relates to him endorsing our violence impact on children learning report. It, we were introduced in 2019 of November. And in 2020, uh, February of 2020, we convened over at the Chestnut Street YMCA. We had a discussion about this. And Senator Paul Boone from Washington and was so gracious to be a part of this process with survivors, community members. And then he announced that this report had really impressed him. And he announced on the U.S. Senate board that he was putting it in the congressional record and he still thanks you for that for the kids. Let me just follow up on that. I don't have all the answers. I'm perfectly willing to admit to that. And if anybody has all the answers, we've already fixed it. So this for these involved. We just do this because uh, our more police, less police, make more laws, make less laws. We just do something. We're so much. It hasn't been that easy. I do think, though, that sometimes we think it's all uh, we look to government. Government's going to have an answer. I think religion and faith is part of part of the answer. I think marriage and family is part of the answer. But I can't make you get married. I can't make you wait to get married. I'm not going to criticize you if you have kids and you're not married. But if you do wait, it helps. It helps economically. It helps a lot of ways. There's a statistic that Kelly showed me the other day that I think is fascinating that a young black man with a mother and father in the same household is less likely to get involved in the law than a young white male of the same age who has a single parent. And this isn't to condemn anybody for being single, but this is from the mentioning. It's like, like, oh, you're telling people they're bad. No, I'm not. I'm just saying our statistics and show having a mother and a father help. But it's not there. I think the mentorship programs are good and trying to be somebody there. And the last time I got to Christopher and some other, they were talking about Russell Cohen was there. We we're talking about maybe bringing in people, maybe the one that shoots somebody has to go to jail. Yes, we all agree with that. But maybe the other people that are his friends and his gang members, you can say, look, you've got a choice. You know, we're going to divert you into some sort of mentorship program. Somebody don't get that. But before you shoot somebody, maybe we can get them out of this. Uh, and, then, and then the other thing, some people look at crime and say, that it's a small number of people committing a lot of crimes. So, I mean, of all the murders you've had in Omaha, or it might be really a hundred people. I mean, I don't know. The number, what do you think? Of right. And Gene, I'll be really quick with this. So, if there is some data and theories that there's a small amount of individuals who uh, kind of inflict this wound on the whole of the community. That could be very true. I don't know if we can get to a specific number. But I do know one thing, we got to start early uh, uh, spaces. And I just quickly want to mention that most of you all have heard many times, maybe too many times, how people get rushed to university hospital, they get treated. And you might hear reports about that person's okay or that person's in ICU or that person's in yet, yet non life, not life threatening. My relationship with University uh, Hospital, I've been 20 years in my advocacy now. 15 years have been with doctors and, and nurses and staff at University of Louisville Hospital just on a volunteer basis. What we did and, and what I'm so proud about now is the same conversations about a hurt conversation being so redundant. And we know part of the hurt is connected to the hospital as relates to them treating these individuals. I went to them several months ago and pitched an idea and said, what about surgeons? Also, when the medical students, like the medical students from the University of School of Medicine reached out to me last year as related to the summer of unrest and said, we want to partner with you about social justice issues. So I told them fine. I said, but we've got a problem with children, secondary trauma, and direct trauma for some, in so much violence. And you all partnered with us on that. So the surgeons, medical students, staff, and our Game Changers organization came together to create future deal. What does that entail? We take kids from the ages of four years old into 13. We're bringing them into the hospital space to be a part of this medical team to create this program. So since we have conversations of hurt, now we want to have conversations of healing. And I had this idea that it might be the way to get this thing sparked. I took my own four grandchildren who almost got hit by AK-47 rounds, 
and God willing, we got lucky that they didn't get hit. They weren't targets. It was just spray bullets that hit a townhouse and somebody was shooting at a target. Put all four of them in scrubs the stethoscope. Took a photo, told Universal Global Hospital, here's our photo to get this started. And now we have so many parents that are calling us to be in this program. I would just like to say this to you, it's not stop the bleed, that's not what we're doing. But what we're trying to do is create a mindset because we see black kids in great art forms like what Ed White does with River City Drum Corps, educational programs, equally in the arts and entertainment and sports. But we rarely, never rarely have seen, if at all, especially in Metro Louisville, black kids projected in the medical field with that kind of projection to say, guess what? I want to be a healer as we talk about the herd. And that's what we're doing. And uh, Gina, I would just say this, as it relates to violence, the key for me is, is that we seriously take a step. And this is easy for everybody in the moment. Stick with what Walt's doing at Air Corps. Stick with the educational opportunities that the Rotarians love to be a part of as it relates to trying to get us back on track and let parents know that your kid is worth my time if you want to be a volunteer, because that's how we beat violence long term. We educate ourselves out of this by helping the children. Okay, thank you so much. Both of you. Did you have more to say? You sure don't have magic? Okay, we got that much. Uh, so guys, uh for Terry, you're sure free to ask questions. I think I have to scan my great. So uh somebody couldn't get the mic. Yeah. Any questions from Rotarians? Rotarians only. Any questions? You might be keep going. Yes. Hey, now come on up here. And, uh, I'm going to have you say why you ran away in the mic. So, anybody who's got a question, you got to go to them. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. for both of you, both of your all service. So, I feel to some degree the phrase is very complicated. It's kind of a comment. And at one level, I think it's really not very complicated. It comes down to fun. High volumes of funding. Um, I do agree with you, Senator Paul, that government is not the best implementer of those funds. When, comes up, when you think in terms of like efficiency and innovation, you never think of it. You think of an organization like DOA, Volunteers of America, which basically receives government contracts and is exceedingly innovative and very creative and doing some fabulous work. So I guess I want to challenge that uh, to both of you to say that, well, it's complicated, thus there's no answer. Again, with funding, when you look at uh, what Mr. White has done, it's extraordinary work. What if his budget were double, triple, quadruple, and him? Okay, where the funds come from, I don't know. I mean, the government's more than likely going to be able to do it, not strength. So I just want to push back on that. I feel like funding is fundamental, and a lack of funding is yeah, not better. Kind of complicated. Uh, no. Yeah, oh, <laughs> <laughs> let me give clarity what you want me about. I think it's highly complicated to go around chasing shooters who are in clandestine type atmospheres that you will, at some level, will never, in my opinion, be successful to do intervention work with. Because at the end of the day, one thing I've learned in 20 years. Most shooters are not about these kind of conversations or even conversations with them. In their mindset, it's about survival and it's also about the hurt they feel. So flash back out in regards to one shooting leads to another shooting. That's what I meant by complicated. Now, not that programs don't help this situation. They do. However, at the end of the day, if you want to chase ants, this is just me describing it. One's welcome to do that, and I don't believe at the current level what the shooting is going on. Nobody will be able to pinpoint the individuals who are shooting and try to bring them into this mindset that we need you to put down that gun and be a part of a process to heal. Uh, I'd rather spend a lot of quality time like Ed White's been doing for many decades with the kids and trying to evolve them into the mindsets. These issues are detrimental to your health, and that's what I meant by complicated. It's complicated to try to stop the shoes, not easy at all. 
I agree with the premise that um, subcontracting to private charitable groups is much better than the government. The government's virtually incompetent. It just stretches to pay the truth. And they get the wrong incentive. They're well intended, but sometimes the wrong incentive to build into it. Um, it's even with welfare, they're disincentive to get married. You can get a little bit more money if you're not married. That, that makes no sense at all, really. Marriage is something we should encourage, not discourage. It has to be, though, within the context of we bring in $3 trillion in taxes and we spend $4 trillion every year already. There is a lot of money, and some of the money doesn't hasn't necessarily gone to good things. Some of it's well intended. So, for example, you said we should provide housing. That's what we did, but we made these massive housing complexes. And in some ways, we took people away from neighborhoods. There were uh, many black neighborhoods raised by urban renewal and said, oh, no, you'll be much happier in this 20-story building. And it turned out not to be as great as the black neighborhoods we once had, the neighborhoods we had for, for many people. So we have to take that with a grain of salt. Giving it to private charities is better. But to me, when I look at government spending, it isn't should we spend it on this? All right, I'm, I'll, I'm for you. So let's take away from selling the borrowing. That's just sort of you know my fiscal conservatism. If I can give you an example, we spend $50 billion a year in Afghanistan every year. We've been there 20 years trying to build a nation over there. We got nation building problems here. We have problems in Louisville. So if you ask me, should we spend it in Afghanistan or Louisville? I'm all with you. Let's spend it in Louisville. Borrowing it, I just think uh, my concern is what that does with us also. So we have to put it in that context. But I do agree with you, Dr. Thomas. Okay, we have our standby questions for Rotarians only. Sorry, Mr. Wade. And Rotarians, if you would uh, say your name and your affiliation, please. I'm Denise Sears, um, SOS International. Uh, first of all, um, I, I the first time I actually disagreed with Neville a little bit. Um, <laughs> however, I do agree. Um, Ed White maybe doesn't remember me, but when I left Neighborhood House, <laughs> He knew how much I loved listening to him working with the kids, and they threw me a go in the way party and surprised me, and they had a whole performance for me. So I do want him to get more money, but right, we keep throwing money at solutions. And I'm going to cite my friend General Rob Gibbons. I overheard him talking earlier, you know, about his work, right? So when he was a pilot, you didn't have a bunch of pilots up there with no plan, no coordinated plan, they all knew what they were going to do. When it comes to the issues of violence, it isn't just faith and family, that's great. It's economic development, it's, it's housing stability, it's education, there's so many components and they're all working and getting money to them, you know, to their organizations, public, private, but there's not a comprehensive plan and I'm, I truly believe that that is the downfall of success for all the money that we spent, and here we are. I, I agree. I, I'm not. I agree completely that this should be an overall plan, but on the education aspect of it, if you do the same thing over and over again, you get the same result. If you think the Jefferson County education system is fine and it's doing what everybody has, a service in the West End, I agree. Yeah, you, you're not really helping anybody. I'm not saying you, but people who think that we don't need to change. For example. And I'll, I'll tell you, I've, I've been to some of the best schools in the country, uh, Boys Latin School in Philadelphia. Every kid is from the inner city, mostly broken homes, a lot of drug problems in these neighborhoods. A hundred boys graduate every year. They take Latin for four years. These young men look you in the eye, shake their hand, you know they're going to succeed. Almost everyone goes to college. But instead, and this is both parties, you know what they're telling you, know what they're telling you in Louisville? Yeah, whatever. 10% of you are in college, 5% you get, and maybe they're not smart enough. To be. It's absolutely untrue. You're giving them a crappy education. Mm -hmm. Give them better schools, let them choose where they go to schools, let them take their money and go to the east side, west side, north side, and go wherever they want by their own choice with their own money. So I have a bill that says take your Title I funds, which are supposed to go to poor kids, give it to the families, not as cash, but as a piece of paper, let them go wherever they want. <laughs> All right, guys, this is awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really do appreciate the uh, comments and, and the, uh, the questions. All right, I would like to bring Jill Cruz back to the podium for announcements and uh, door applause.
Thank you, gentlemen, for your words, good comments. Um, let's see, save the date. Our next business networking event will be Tuesday, August 3rd at 5 p.m. Mike Richardson and the Glenview Trust Company will host us at the new headquarters on Highway 42. Bill Stone, a CNBC contributor, will be sharing some economic insights. Um, on Saturday, August the 7th, our club will cheer on the local city FC when they take on a sporting KC2 in the new stadium for Rotary Night. And tickets for the game are $32 each, and the seats are in section 220. The event is open to Rotarians, family members, and friends. Tickets are limited, so register now on DAC TV or email or call the Rotary office. Next week's week, excuse me, next week's meeting will feature Rotary Fireside Riverside Chat with Gerilyn Green, Global Chief Communications Officer at Young Grants. As you know, we have a new reservation system and we appreciate you registering in your attendance. And if you plan to have lunch in advance, please note that the reservation closed on Friday at close of business. This is a deadline by the restaurants is requiring us to do. So please respond to your intentions. The meeting will also be available on Zoom. Uh, watch for the emails from the office. Happy birthday to the Rotarian celebrating this week it is Walton Tyler on July 2nd, Dr. Raj on July 3rd, and Shahida. I'm sorry, on July 3rd, and wish you all a happy birthday. Now, uh, if you put your business card, then uh, you have a helper. Where's the... Uh... have a lovely daughter, Lady Sophia. This is her job, but she's not feeling well today, so I'm going to do it for her. So, Angela Bailey. Yeah. And thank you all so much. Uh, remember our uh, meeting next week. You can come in person or via Zoom. And so I have to be here. Thank you very much. Do good and enjoy doing it.